Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Kate Keller this morning. Um, so Kate completed her grad school at the University of Edinburgh on my side of the pond. Um, Kate completed grad school at the University of Edinburgh before going on to do her postdoc on extracellular matrix biology at Shriners in Hospital for Children in Portland, Oregon, where she has remained. Um, she joined the KCI Institute in 2003 and is now a professor there, um, doing her research on the trabecular meshwork, which um, she's a leader in the field of the extracellular matrix biology in the trabecular meshwork tissue. Um, and her goal really is to um, discover the various ECM components involved in the trabecular meshwork and determine how they can be leveraged to increase outflow through the TM. And from there, Kate, I'll let you take it away. Well, thank you, um, Fiona, for a kind introduction. And thank you for the Moran Eye Center for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm hoping that you can all hear me okay. And um, the title of my talk today is Trabecular Meshwork, um, Intraocular Pressure and Glaucoma. Um, see. Um, I do have one disclosure. Um, I'm going to show one experiment that um, uses Natacidil, which was um, sponsored by Airy Pharmaceuticals. So here's the outline of my talk today. Today I'm going to talk about the intraocular pressure, glaucoma. We're going to talk about methods to study the IOP in vitro and in vivo. We're going to talk about the Morrison controlled elevation of IOP rodent model. And then I'm going to switch gears completely and talk about targeting the actin situs skeleton to reduce intraocular pressure. So I don't really need to introduce glaucoma to this group, but um, here we go with this um, irreversible blinding eye disease, and it affects over 60 million people worldwide and an aging population. This is probably going to increase significantly in the next um, 20, 30 years. Glaucoma is a group of diseases. Um, the main one that most people study are is primary open angle glaucoma, but there's normal tension glaucomal angle closure congenital um, and many other forms. The main risk factors are um, age, increasing age, um, race, family history, and of course, elevated intraocular pressure. So, Normal pressure is around 15 millimeters of mercury and high elevated, uh, elevated IOP is anything over 20. And it's due to buildup of the aqueous fluid in the anterior chamber, um, due to blockage in the aqueous drainage pathways in the trabecular meshwork. When this happens, it pushes the lens and the vitreous all back onto the um, optic nerve at the back of the eye. And this causes axon degeneration and vision loss. So intraocular pressure, um, the aqueous is continuously produced by the ciliary body here. It flows into the anterior chamber through the pupil and it drains out through the trabecular meshwork to Schlem's canal and the venous system. The trabecular meshwork is a small triangular piece of tissue that not many people um, work on, but I find it very interesting. Um, it builds a resistance to aqueous ache outflow, and this generates the IOP. And once that IOP is high enough, um, aqueous flows out to Schlem's canal. And it passes through the TM as a bulk flow, and it's driven by that pressure gradient, and it's, there's no active transport that is involved. Um, so when you have, when an aqueous humor production by the ciliary equals the drainage through the TM, um, you get a normal um, IOP of about 15 millimeters of mercury. And here's the typical um, Goldman equation. IOP is the rate of formation divided by the outflow facility plus the episclerous um, venous pressure. And um, outflow, we know that outflow resistance in the TM it increases with age, but it increases a lot more with um, POAG, and this results in the elevated IOP. So IOP is not actually constant throughout the day. Um, there's been new studies done with this um, contact lens sensor called TriggerFish, 
Um, it measures pressure throughout the day for 24 hour period. And you can see in the daytime, most of the IOPs are lower than in the nighttime. And then if we look at the um, three groups of patients here, they have healthy subjects in blue, HOAG patients in red and normal tension glaucoma in green. You can see that the pressures in the POAC patients come up earlier in the um, day and they peak higher in the nighttime than the normal subjects in blue. And this can also be seen in the normal tension group as well. And so the peak times for the um, peak IOP occur earlier in the nighttime, excuse me, um, compared to the normal subjects. And this is, you know, this is very interesting because when um, patients come into the clinic, they usually have one IOP test uh, during the day sometime. Um, it just gives a snapshot. So this is really um, giving interesting information, especially for those normal tension glaucoma group. And then another group has um, shown um, the circadian IOP in the normal tensions um, patients. Um, which are in the black circles here. Um, anything towards the outer edge is the higher pressure um, compared to the lower pressure to the center here. And you can see that um, all the non-glaucoma patients have their peak IOPs um, during the nighttime, whereas a significant portion of the normal tension um, patients have them during the daytime. So even though they're called normal tension, um, they're not actually normal um, IOPs. And as a cl clinical strategies, um, the only um, the, the only therapy that is available to glaucoma patients right now is um, lowering their IOP. And how did we do this? Well, pharmaceuticals have been developed, and they can um, target different paths paths of the outflow pathway. So there's the aqueous humor suppressants, such as the beta blockers and the alpha-2 agonists. And these um, target the ciliary body and they suppress production of aqueous humor. Um, about 20 to 30% of aqueous actually exits um, the anterior chamber through this uveal scleral pathway. And increasing the outflow through this pathway via the prostaglandin analogs and the alpha-2 agonists, um, uh, it's also been used as a clinical therapy. And then um, this targeting the traditional conventional pathway through the trabecular meshwork. Um, this is where 70 to 80% of aqueous um, flows out of the anterior chamber. And the new class of rokinase inhibitors target the TM, and there's also um, cholinergics, um, such as pilocarpin. And then this is the first line of attack, and if this doesn't work in the clinic, um, then the glaucoma surgeons get pretty pretty nasty to the tissue, which is, in my opinion, not nice because I like the trabecular meshwork. So they make holes in the, um, in the sclera, and um, this helps drain aqueous um, out of the anterior chamber. Even more macabre is that they put a suture in through the hole of um, the tra trabecular, me trabecular meshwork, and then they just rip it out. And then they burn holes in it. Um, they can use laser trabeculoplasty um, using ALT or SLT. Um, these differ slightly in the the um, the energy and laser power um, that they burn the holes, and also um, how far circumference, um, how many holes you go around the circumference of the TM. So I'm here to convince you that the TM is actually a very interesting tissue. Um, and oh, and this is a um, nice um, summary of all the um, therapeutics that are currently on the market for um, glaucoma. So this is from Miriam Kalko's group in Denmark, um, a, um, the review article here. Um, and you can see that the main stay of glaucoma therapies is IOP lowering. Um, there's a couple of vascular um, um, therapies out there and a few neuroprotective therapies. But as a basic research scientist, um, my goal is to understand the TM at a molecular or cellular level and understand how this TM regulates IOP in order to develop new glaucoma therapies. So here is just an um, 
H&E section of a cross section of TM um, showing the uveal and coneal scleral meshwork. Down here is what's known as the juxta canalicular region or JCT, um, and that's right next to Schlem's canal. And this is just a schematic of the same thing. Aqueous is gonna flow through around all these fenestrated beams out through the juxta canicular um, region to Schlem's canal. And in this JCT region, there's abundant extracellular matrix, and that is what composes um, the outflow resistance. In glaucomatous TM, um, there's a much more disorganized extracellular matrix. So um, they found thickened um, extracellular th sheaths surrounding the elastic fibers. And this causes narrowing of the um, outflow channels so that aqueous can't flow through and out to Schlem's canal. And then the other, um, the other um, phenotype that they found is that um, this reduced cellularity. Um, so in normal um, aged TMs, there's a, a few cells as you get older, but in POAG, this is much more pronounced and there's much fewer cells there. So then I want to move on to how can we study um, intraocular pressure in, in the lab? So the mainstay that I've been working on is anterior segment perfusion culture. This is an organ culture system. And here um, we take a human eye um, from, we get them from cadaverized from the local eye bank. And we bisect them. We take out all the lens, the um, iris, the ciliary. And so we're left with um, a cup basically of anterior um, tissue. And this contains cornea, sclera, trabecular meshwork. And we leave a little bit of sclera on there so that we can clamp it into this chamber. And then we can perfuse serum-free media up into the um, an anterior segment and it flows out and drains out through the trabecular meshwork. And according to the height of this bottle, um, we can mimic um, just normal tension. Um, so normal tends of about 15 millimeters of mercury, but of course we don't have the epiphenous um, pressure there. So it works out to about eight millimeters of mercury. But if we raise this bottle, we can actually give um, a, a 2X pressure and that mimics what is happening when um, IOP is elevated to glaucoma patients. And so what happens when we do this? Um, so we can, flow flow at an, um certain constant uh, constant flow rate um to give that eight millimeters of mercury and then if we double the pressure um immediately the flow rate increases but over time it actually comes down and it homeostasis down back to normal over you know three two to three days so i homey IOP homeostasis is defined as the corrective adjustments of the aqueous humor outflow resistance, which occur in direct response to the sustained pressure changes and which maintain IOP within acceptable physiological ranges. So how does this happen um, with molecules that are happening in the um, TM? So in the dark, line here. This is just again showing that you can double the pressure and it comes down over the next um, couple of days. But at the same time, if we look at um, gelatinase A, which is also known as matrix metalloproteinase 2, this immediately goes up and becomes activated. And these are the enzymes that chew up the extracellular matrix. And this is another matrix metalloproteinase called Adams TS4. And in control sections, you can see that there's um, small punctate dots throughout the TM um, and very few along the juxtacanalicular area. Whereas if um, this section is from an eye, um, a human eye that has been perfused at 2x pressure for 48 hours, and you can see that the um, Adams TS4 is highly increased right along the JCT area, um, right where we would expect it to be if it's chewing up the extracellular matrix in response to pressure. 
Um, other labs have looked at um, genes that are altered in this perfusion system in response to the high antiviral pressure. So this is work by Tourette Boris's group. Um, she um, perfused at 15 millimeters of mercury or 50. Um, and then at different time points, she looked at the genes that were changing in response. And this has been very effective at looking at um, um, increased um, um, genes, extra, some of them extracellular matrix. And she's um, looked at this one called matrix GLA protein, which is um, very interesting. The other thing that we can look at is segmental outflow. Now, what is segmental outflow? So um, Doug Johnson, um, back in the late 80s, noticed that um, pigment granules um, would be collected in certain regions around the circumference of the TM. And um, Dave Epstein's group went on to use catenized ferritin to study this further. And they called um, regions of high and low outflow um, um, segmental outflow. So this is um, an, a study that we've done relatively recently, and this was with fluorescent nanoparticles. We add them to the perfusion system, and again, they they flow into um, all areas around the circumference of the TM, but there's regions of um, where they go faster, so that's the high flow regions and the low flow regions where there's relatively few fluorescence nanoparticles. And then you can cut these sections out. And um, in this case, um, we're looking at um, genes. So we isolated the RNA and um, found the extracellular matri matrix genes are ch change expression within these high and low flow areas. So certain collagens, um, integrins, laminins, matrix metalloproteinase are enriched in the high flow regions where others are um, relatively enriched in the low flow regions. And this can have clinical implications. So this is um, work done with Alex Wang's group. And actually Fiona um, was on this paper, which was very interesting. Um, they've been using aqueous um, angiography to, uh, to find out these high flow and low flow regions. So again, here's a high flow region and a low flow regions. And then Alex was doing trabecular bypass um, surgery. And they found that if you put your um, surgery in the low flow regions, you actually get a greater outflow facility when targeting those low flow um, regions. So this um, the segmental outflow, you know, studying it at the basic um, research side of it can have clinical implications of um, where would be the best place to um, do your surgeries. So um, the summary of the anterior segment, um, the advantages are that it's a really easy system to set up. Um, you, you can use um, human eyes, but if you don't have access to those, you can use um, pig eyes or bovine, bovine eyes. It's very easy to ma manipulate, so you can um, change the pressure, you can add um, drugs, um, you can do it for different time points, up to about two weeks. Um, it's very easy to harvest the cells and the tissues at specific time points in the experiment, and um, they've been really helpful to identify genes and pathways involved in IOP homeostasis. But the major disadvantage is that they don't fully recapitulate the in vivo environment. So people have used um, in vivo models, um, and um, many people have used mice because they're very small and easy to use. And they've done various methods to increase um, atrial pressure. One of the main ones that people use is called this microbead occlusion model. So they inject polystyrene microbeads into the anterior chamber. And as the aqueous flows down through the TM, it takes the beads and it blocks all the um, outflow channels. And as that happens, the intraocular pressure increases. And then they've been looking at um, the optic nerve injury and found like after about 10 days to two weeks, they find um, axon degeneration. 
Other groups have used um, various um, viruses to transduce um, molecules into this, so um, AAVs and adenoviruses. Um, for instance, this TGF-2, um, when you put that into um, and jink that into camerally, um, you, it can produce the IOP increase of 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. And of course, there's the jet genetically modified mice. Um, one of the, the the main ones here is the DBA2J mice. They have a spontaneous mutation that um, causes sloughing of pigment granules from the ciliary. And again, that um, goes into the trabecular meshwork, blocks the outflow channels, and it causes IOP increases. Um, and there's another one called myosillin. Um, this transgenic mouse has um, the human myosillin with one of the mutations that they found in glaucoma um, patients. And again, that causes um, axon degeneration in the um, posterior pole. Other people have been using dexamethasone. Um, it's a corticosteroid, um, and this induces extracellular matrix production, um, which hinders the aqueous outflow, much like what we saw in the glaucoma. Um, and then finally, they um, use laser treatment again to um, burn away the um, TM um, in photocoagulation. So again, these um, mice models um, are really good and have helped a lot of um, basic researchers. Um, they're relatively cheap. You can um, they can be easily genetically modified. Uh, they're useful for studying the effects of specific genes, proteins, um, or signaling pathways. And they're very, very good for looking at the optic nerve responses. But there's several disadvantages. Um, there's little control of the level or the onset of IOP elevation. So when you put like beads in there, um, we don't know exactly if, they're, if the IOP is immediate, if it stays up. Um, or if there's fluctuations and spikes are happening. Um, many of these models, the IOP is only monitored intermittently, like, like how you do with the glaucoma, glaucoma patients in the clinic. So they maybe will be only being monitored maybe once, twice a week. And in nearly all of these models, the TM cell function is disrupted, or destroyed, or compromised in some way. So we can't use these models to look at the TM cell function. So other models are needed to identify genes related to IOP homeostasis. So now I'm going to talk um, about the Morrison controlled elevation of IOP. So John Morrison is one of my colleagues at the KCI Institute. He's a glaucoma clinician, but he's had um, a, a basic research lab um, for many, many years now. <laughs> and he uses rats. Um, and the choice of rats um, is that the eyes are bigger than mice. And so they're just slightly easier to handle. The, the rat model is still relatively cheap. And the angle and outflow anatomy is very similar to the human. So this is just um, a cross section of the rat eye um, with the anterior chamber, iris, ciliary body. Um, here's the angle, the trabecular meshworks right there. And then this is a collector channel distal to Schlem's canal. And there's just a more higher magnification of the trabecular meshwork. I will say that it is slightly different in that it's not as um, big as the human um, trabecular meshwork, there's only maybe one or two of those fenestrated beams, but it still has the JCT area. So in 2016, um, John and his team um, um, did this, um, this publication and called it the Controlled Elevation of IOP. And here, the anterior chamber is cannulated, and um, you can do this on, on four rats at a time, and you continually um, monitor the blood pressure, the oxygen, the heart rate, and the breathing rate. And um, for the, the ex duration of the experiment, which is usually eight hours, these rats do absolutely fine. So this is, let me just turn off my pointer so I can,
So this is a little video showing how to cannulate the rat eye. Um, use a 31 gauge needle to poke a hole through the cornea. And then they thread in um, a small tube to cannulate the, the anterior chamber. And the tip of the tube, um, it doesn't touch the iris. It doesn't, um, it just sits in the anterior chamber. And this tube is connected to a larger tube that goes up to um, a bottle full of um, balanced salt solution. And again, like that anterior segment perfusion model, um, by varying the height of the bottle, um, it, it gives the pressure that the eye will receive. So the major advantages of this model is that you can set IOP to define pressure. Um, you know exactly when you're actually applying that pressure to the eye, and then you can use it for various defined um, IOP durations. So we decided to use this model, I, I, and I will say that tube because it's not, um, it doesn't touch the TM. Um, it, we can now go ahead and look at um, what's happening in the TM in response to elevated IOP in vivo for the first time. So what do we, um, when we're designing our experiment, what do, what things do we have to consider? Well, we have to consider the duration of the experiment, the IOP level, and then what controls can we use? So for duration, um, we chose eight hours. So we know that the eight hours, um, the rats all survive um, anesthesia and um, they sit there quite happily. And um, from our anterior segment work, we know that a homeostatic response is launched after six hours. So we expect to find um, genes involved in the homeostatic response um, if we give them a pressure of for eight hours. And it has no effects, an eight hour pressure has no adverse effects on heart rate or any of the other physiological um, readings that we're taking. But what is normal tense of IOP in rats? Um, again, rats show a circadian IOP, much like the humans. It's higher at the night and lower during the day. But the mean IOP over the 24 hour period is about 21 millimeters of mercury. Um, and the peak in the nighttime is about uh, 30. So for designing our experiment, we chose to have our normal tense of um, IOPs at 20 millimeters of mercury. Our hypertensive group um, is going to be 50, which is about 2x what the peak IOP is. And then we kind of have a group, group of animals that have are naive, so they've had no surgery or no anesthesia. Um, they've just been running around in their cages. So we performed the CAI on um, brown Norway rats. Um, we, these are typically used um, and actually have an advantage over other rat species because um, um, the TM is pigmented in these ones compared to say albino rats. They're retired breeders, so they're aged about six to nine months. Um, and we used equal numbers of males and females and each group had an um, N of 11 or 12 per group. We monitor IOP carefully with a tonometer. So we might measure it every 30 minutes over that eight hour period. And um, the mean IOP for each of the animals over that time in the CEI 20 was right about 20. And those in the hypertensive group were right around 50. And at the end of the experiment, we enucleate the eyes and dissect the TM and we came out with a paper um, just earlier this year describing this method in detail. Um, there's a nice video if you want to go and have a look at the video. <laughs> um, but we bisect the eye, we cut it into quadrants, the ciliary and iris is removed. Um, we put pins here just to give it a little bit of tension to pull it off. This one shows just a need, a small pin that's been pushed up through the um, TM so that you can see that pigmented TM there. And then we use um, Julius forceps to pick it out and just peel it back. And here's a section here that has TM and you can see the slight pigmentation. Um, and in the white arrow, um, you can see the translucent, translucent, translucent area 
um, of the outer wall of Shalem's Canal right there. So then we did um, histology and immunostaining on some sections, but most of the eyes were, um, the TM was taken out and we, um, the RNA was isolated from the cells in the TM. So we first assessed whether we were doing a good job at dissecting the TMs. Here are h &E sections um, before we dissected and after we dissected, here's the TM. And post dissection, we've done a pretty good job of removing all of the TM. And again, this is just immunostaining with uh, smooth muscle actin and green um, to show that it's pretty much removed from these eyes. And then we also wanted to make sure that we didn't really have much contamination from the ciliary. So we used um, three genes, matrix GLA protein, myosilin, and chitinase 3-like proteins. These are biomarkers of TM. Um, and in TM tissue, these were um, high as expected compared to ciliary um, body. And then ciliary markers were desmond, mycin, heavy chain 11. Um, and in the TM samples, these were relatively low. So we were fairly sure that um, we're getting quite clean dissections here. So then we went ahead and isolated the RNA and um, we didn't have um, enough to do RNA-seq analysis. So we chose this um, technology called Nanostring. Um, it uses RNA um, to uh, directly, you don't have to make cDNA. Um, so we used RNA directly and they um, have probes um, that you isolate, that you incubate with the RNA. So there's a capture probe. Um, it has half the target gene sequence on it with a biotin at um, um, the three prime repeat. And then you have your reporter probe that has the other part of the um, target sequence. And then it has these fluorescently labeled RNA se segments and in the four different colors. And the combination of all of these, um, these colors, you can get 700, no, sorry, 972 unique barcode um, fluorescent signals. Um, onto your genes. So once you've incubated it with your RNA samples, um, you bind these probes to streptavidin that's coating the surface of the imaging surface. Um, you flow some fluid over them, then knock them all flat in order for the um, machine, the encounter machine, to actually be able to count these. And one reported barcode is um, equivalent to one messenger RNA molecule. And so obviously, the more um, counts that you get, um, or more barcodes you get, the more abundant those RNA molecules are. They have pre-designed panels that you can choose from. And so we chose this pan cancer um, panel. It has 770 genes and the, um, they're all involved in inflammation or microenvironment and tumor biology. And because cancer involves many extracellular matrix genes, there was many genes on this panel that were of interest to us. And again, we have um, our three group comparisons. So we have um, our CEI 50 millimeters of mercury um, compared to 20. Um, we have 50 versus the naive. And these two groups we're calling, um, I should um, give genes that are IOP related. Uh, whereas the other group, which is the CEI 20 versus the naive, this is probably going to give genes that are more related to um, the cannulation procedure or um, the anesthesia. So looking at the three different groups, this is the 50 versus 20, the 50 versus naive, and the 20 versus naive. So these two groups here, um, we found that there was, together there was um, 46 genes that we we're calling the IOP related genes, and the, the blue and the red um, highlighted genes here were found in both of these um, groups. So we're quite confident that they are IOP related. And then we found um, 55 genes that may be more cannulation or anesthesia related. 
when we put this IOP related genes into um, bioinformatics software um, called ShinyGo, um, we did a keg pathway analysis and the upregulated genes um, included um, um, the ubiquitin mediated proteolysis um, and notch signaling pathway. This is um, involved in cellular communication. And then the downregulated genes, um, very interestingly, um, pulled out the TGF beta signaling pathway. And you know when you treat um, um, TM cells with TGF beta, they actually produce more ECM. Um, so we're kind of thinking that that might um, be a protective measure that um, it, it, in, when when the TM is exposed to these higher pressures, it's actually downregulating TGF TGF pathway genes and um, suppressing that extracellular matrix production. So um, in summary for this part of the talk, um, the CEI rat model um, is very useful for studying IOP in vivo. This is the first time it's been done um, in vivo for the TM. Um, the cannulation procedure <laughs> is relatively simple and we're monitoring IOP regularly. So we know exactly what's happening in these animals. Um, but one of the limitations is that um, eight hours seems to be about a maximum time point for the animals. Um, um, anything further than that is not, it's, it can be very harmful. So. Um, TM can be dissected from the enucleated rat eyes, but it needs skilled surgeons um, that's done di under a dissecting microscope. Um, we have managed to isolate RNA from the TMs, um, but it, they're in small quantities um, and it's not been enough yet to do our full RNA-seq analysis. So we've used nanostring technology and this has been um, useful um, because we've identified IOP-related um, genes. But this panel that we chose was a mouse panel. Um, they don't have a um, pre-designed rat panel yet. Um, and so um, there's a good homology, but there's some of those genes that are on that panel that are not completely homologous. Okay, so now I want to um, shift gears completely and um, talk just a little bit about the actin cytoskeleton and how that um, has been targeted to reduce intraocular pressure. So um, this is just a uh, schematic of the actin cytoskeleton. Um, the um, actin within the cell can assemble into different structures, including phyllopodia, um, lamellopodia, or stress fibers. Um, my talk um, later today will be talking a lot about um, the phyllopodia and these things called tunneling nanotubes, which will be very interesting. Um, but right now, I'm going to focus on the rho kinase pathway. So this, um, once this is activated, it leads to formation of um, stress fibers. And um, if you inhibit this pathway, um, we know that um, it increases outflow. And this is the, um, this was the development of Ropressa, which is one of the FDA approved um, glaucoma drugs that's on the market these days. So what are actin stress file fibers? Well, they're contractile actomyosin bundles, and they're anchored at each end by focal adhesions. And when we take um, normal TM cells or um, TM cells from a glaucoma eye, and we place them in culture, and we label the actin, we can see that um, glaucoma TM cells have much thicker and more prominent stress fibers than their normal um, TM cells. And if you measure the width of these things, um, you show it, um, significant e increase in um, the filament width in glaucoma cells compared to the normal cells. We also did live um, imaging, let me turn off my laser pointer, um, of normal and glaucoma. Um, so if we start up this movie, so these are the stress fibers here in a normal um, TM cell. And you can see that they're um, turning over, it's called treadmilling, and they're forming, disassembling. There's little um, 
dots, punctate dots of actin rich vesicles, and these are moving around quite happily in these um, normal TM cells. But when we do live cell imaging of glaucoma TM cells, you can already see that they're much more um, prominent stress fibers. They're not um, being treadmilled as fast or in fact, hardly at all. And then these little actin vesicles, some of them are moving around, but many of them are just sitting there doing nothing. And so um, we can see by live cell microscopy that the actin dynamics in normal and glaucomatous TM cells um, are highly different. So um, back in the um, mid nineties, um, they started looking at the actin cytoskeleton and targeting it with the actin myosin drugs like latrunculin. Um, and this was pioneered by um, David Epstein and Paul Kaufman. Um, and when they put some of these drugs into the anterior segment fusion culture system, um, they showed a nice increase um, in outflows facility over time. And then over the years, um, they, um, they refined this slightly and um, looked at that pathway and realized it was the rho kinase um, pathway that was um, very interesting. And um, Vasanth Rao has um, a good um, um, review article here um, telling you all about um, the effects of rho A inhibition, um, both on TM and Schlem's canal cells. Um, but also in the optic nerve, um, I'm thinking that it might be slightly um, neuroprotective, and then also um, for use in glaucoma filtration surgery. So Dave Epstein um, and Casey Kapinski in um, North Carolina, um, they they developed um, the company Airy Pharmaceuticals. And this was their um, rokinase inhibitor that they um, developed. It's called metacidil. So it inhibits rokinase, but it also inhibits the norepinephrine transporter. And teamed up with Casey um, and tested the effects of natacidil um, on normal and glaucoma TM cells. So this was just still images of um, live cell imaging at zero minutes or 120 minutes. So you can see um, TM cells have these stress fibers, and after two hours, they basically disappear um, after natastil treatment. And then here's the same set of experiments with glaucoma TM cells. Again, they start off with um, prominent stress fibers. And after two hours, like for this cell, they're more or less all gone, which is fine. But there's many cells that you still have some stress fibers left. Um, so natacidil isn't quite as good and effective on um, reducing stress fiber um, in the glaucoma cells. The actin cytoskeleton is also very important for um, phagocytosis. Um, TM cells are highly phagocytic. So when um, um, aqueous flows in through the TM on its way out to Schlem's canal. Um, the TM cells engulf particles and debris um, that are collected in the aqueous humor. Um, and when they're forming these phagocytic um, pits, actin is used to polymerase out into a little cup that goes and engulfs the particle. Um, Abe Clark's group shown that phagocytosis is um, impaired in glaucoma TM cells um, in the white here compared to normal. And then we found we were doing this experiment with the natastil with live cell imaging. And oops. so these are actin rich um, particles that have been secreted and deposited onto the surface. And this cell here, it's going and, um, and um, engulfing them. But the minute that we add um, natastil, it highly, it becomes highly phagocytic. And I look at this, it feels like it's like a little Roomba vacuum cleaner going around and um, sucking up all these um, particles off the surface of the, um, the, the dish here. So this was unexpected. We didn't really expect to find this, but Nisodontacidil apparently it stimulates phagocytosis. 
And in the TM, um, this could aid clearing of the debris from the out outflow channels. And that may be an additional way that this um, drug is acting in the TM. So in summary for the actin cytoskeleton, um, I've shown you that glaucoma TM cells in culture have a less dynamic actin cytoskeleton um, and it has it's, um, have thicker stress fibers than normal TM cells. Um, metosidal is effective at depolymerizing these stress fibers, but it takes much longer in the glaucoma TM cells. And then um, metosidal treatment activates phagocytosis and this potentially helps clearing of the TM outflow channels. So even though you know repressors is now on the market, um, we're still finding out new um, things about it and how it's acting um, on the TM and both um, in situ and also in um, cell culture. And then finally, I just want to finish with a couple of slides about um, um, what new glaucoma therapeutics are in development. So again, this is um, Marian Kolko's um, um, review paper here. Uh, there are still um, IOP lowering drugs that are being developed, um, including here's metacidil, um, and they're, they're linking it up with, for instance, latanoprost, you know, so they're doing these combo drugs. Um, they're also looking still at vascular um, therapies and um, several new neuroprotective um, therapies um, that are in clinical trials right now, including this one called nicotinamide. Um, so it's just a supplement. And then finally, um, there's this group um, in the Mayo Clinic, um, including Mike Fecht and um, UTO, UTO Roy Chowdhury. They've been looking at this um, ATP-sensitive potassium channel opening prodrug. Um, it's called QLS-101. Um, and they made a company called Cularis to study this. Um, and it, instead of acting on the aqueous um, suppressants or increasing um, the out, uveal scleral or conventional outflow, it actually acts on the distal outflow low pathway. So this is anything further on than um, the trabecular meshwork. And they're thinking that this could be used in combination with some of the other drugs. Um, it's currently going through maybe phase one or phase two, um, and they're finding quite interesting effects. So in mice, um, a once daily topical treatment um, was shown to lower the IOP, um, five millimeters of mercury, which is quite a lot in a mouse. Um, and that was good for 24 hours. So that would be the first one that targets um, a different pathway than the conventional um, drugs that have been used. And then finally, I just want to thank um, the members of my lab. So Yung Feng Yang, Ying Yang Sun, Paul Hold, and Fontaine Chen. Fontaine is a very talented medical student who joined our lab for um, a year, so she was great. Um, and then Ted Acott's lab, um, Jan Sprank and Mary Kelly, John Bradley, Minnie Aga. John, um, he, he set up the um, CEI mouse model and members of his group, Deanna, Elisa and Bill, um, have been very good at characterizing that model. And then the last um, part of my talk um, was in collaboration with Casey Kopsinski at Airy Pharmaceuticals. Um, he's now at Alcon because Alcon just took over Airy. And of course, my funding sources um, at the NEI and research for, to prevent blindness. So um, with that, I will stop and I will um, happily answer any questions. Okay, if no one else has any questions. Um, Kate, for that rat model, um, have you looked at segmental flow? Do rats have segmental flow the way humans do? Um, and do you think the ECM would be different in that same way? That's a great question. Um, we haven't actually looked at segmental outflow in the rat yet. Um, I would imagine that it does exist um, because they've shown in mice that it, um, segmental outflow exists. Um, and in the mouse, 
um, studies, they have shown that there are differences in the um, extracellular matrix around the circumference of the eye. So we expect that the rat would show um, the similar thing, but we just haven't done it yet. Thanks. Yeah, great talk. So one thing that was interesting for me was the circadian control of IOP. And if I understood correctly, initially you showed that during the day, it looked pretty similar, even in some uh, glaucoma patients, but then you had much bigger difference during the night. So should we actually do these measurements during night? I, I think so. Um, I, I think that you would get much more information um, that is clinically relevant if you did your measurements in the nighttime, but I don't think you would get much compliance with the patients. I don't think they'd probably be willing to come in and maybe you wouldn't be willing to come in to test their IOPs in the middle of the night. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think having that one snapshot IOP measurement, you know, a couple of times a month, maybe, um, is not giving you a full picture of what is happening with um, IOP, um, both on a circadian 24 hour time or over like a week or months. Um, and so I think these these contact lenses, I think they've still got a ways to go, you know, um, but I think they're providing, providing some very interesting information about actually what, what a patient is feeling. So uh, this nocturnal pressure elevation at night has been known for a long time, actually. And uh, uh, patients who have very good pressures otherwise during the day, when, when they can come in and be seen that are progressing, there have been multiple studies that have gone to the trouble of looking at night. Is their pressures out of control at night? Surprise, surprise. And that's why they're advancing. So um, you've got the problem that patients aren't really happy about coming in at two o'clock in the morning and uh, providers are not really happy about measuring them. So I think the secret is going to be the kinds of things like trigger fish, other simple ways of remote monitoring. And clearly we need to understand that and, and handle it, but it's just been difficult other than in you know specific circumstances, but it is a major problem. And often we're missing the most important point of the day for sure. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think, you know, with all the, you know, I've heard before about like turning your iPhone into a, um, a IOP monitor, you know, so I think, um, you know, there's um, opportunities to, be, to develop new kind of devices and, um, and um, um, technology to help us. Um, self-testing. There's some self-testing coming yeah. along. Patients yeah. can get up and do it, which I think will also be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, a com combination of all of these things will be really useful for a glaucoma clinician um, to get a much better idea of what that patient is actually um, um, being subject to pressure wise. Okay, if there are no more questions, I think we'll end it here. Thank you for your time, Kate. Thanks.